I'm going to move this out of, can I move this out of the way? Sure. Okay, I need some space to roam around. Well, I appreciate you all coming out. We're a small group, so we'll just kind of keep it uh, keep it more informal. I heard there were a lot of cheapskates in town, but apparently they, they didn't make it. Yard sailing. Yes, right, right. That's the, it's the time of year for, for yard sailing. And I saw a big thrift store right back behind us here, Value Village or something like that. It ain't so cheap. It isn't? No? 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 Uh-oh. There's a good one on Trent, though. Is there? Okay, I'll have to get that address for you. So, so it's a real pleasure for me uh, to be here. I love to speak at public libraries. This is certainly a gorgeous public library. And, of course, I'm an active volunteer at my libraries back in Maryland and in Ohio. And I think I've written about libraries in all four of my books. And uh, Of course, when you write for a cheapskate audience, it's little wonder that we love our public libraries. And... Uh, I get a surprising number of uh, emails and, and letters from people who say, you know, dear Jeff, I really appreciate what you're doing, but they always admit they borrowed my book from the library. And you know, that's fine with me. I mean, my publisher doesn't like it so much. My publisher would prefer that he buys a copy of my books. In fact, my publisher called the other day and he said, I got good news and I got bad news about your books. The good news is more than a million people have read them. The bad news is they're cheapskates, they're borrowing them from the library. We've only sold 27 copies. <laughs> it's not that bad, but it's pretty bad. But, uh, but uh, I, I, I do actually get a lot of emails from people who say, Dear Jeff, I liked your last book so much that I spent every lunch hour for the past two weeks standing back at Barnes & Noble and I read the whole thing. You know? Gotta love those uh, those people. So I am Jeff Yeager. I'm known as the ultimate cheapskate, the titan of tightwads, the guru of greenbacks, the maestro and miser, the commander in cheap, and I am, with my head held high, America's cheapest man. And I want to talk to you today about why being a bit of a cheapskate is a good thing. It's a virtue. It's not a vice. At least how I uh, describe it. And I want to talk to you about, one, some ways to maybe save some money, but two, kind of the philosophy that I have in the four books that I've written, uh, my philosophy of life and happiness and so on. Let me just start by saying when I say a cheapskate, I don't mean it in a pejorative sense. Again, it's a virtue, it's not a vice. I chose the word cheapskate in part because Matt Lauer called me one on the NBC Today show, so I sort of ran with that, an attempt to really engage people in what's ultimately a serious conversation about money and happiness and stuff. You can call us frugal, you can call us thrifty, you can call us smart consumers, but the kind of people that I write about, I like to think, know something about what's really important in life. I believe that at the core of what I write about it is something pretty serious, which is I believe that most Americans, not all Americans, but most Americans would actually be happier and the quality of their life would increase if they would only spend and consume less. So it's not about sacrifice or deprivation. The people that I write about, I call them cheapskates. They're not your traditional Scrooge, though. They're not greedy. They're not dishonest. In fact, they're sort of the opposite of those things. I'm always looking for people in what I write who say something to me like this. Sure, I can afford to spend more, but why would I? It wouldn't make me any happier. So those are the kind of people that I write about. So I want to talk, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes or an hour, and I'll have plenty of time at the end uh, for a question and answer. In fact, we're a small enough group. If anybody has some, a burning question or a point to make, feel free just to, to uh, chime in. And uh, I'm uh, happy to stay around afterwards as long as anybody wants to talk cheap with me. Um, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about the books I've written and the kind of people that I write about and why th what I think they have to teach us all about money and happiness. And then I want to talk uh, quickly about a couple of exercises uh, to help you save some money um, and uh, one in some detail, which is sort of my show and tell that I think you'll, uh, you'll appreciate a bunch of tips for how to save money. So before I get into all of that, let me back up and say I could say when I uh, tell when I said I'm America's cheapest man that some of you doubt me. 
I can see that you have some doubt. You may think that you're cheaper than I am. In fact, I get questioned or challenged for that title all the time. And just the other day, a friend of mine challenged my credentials as both a cheapskate and an environmentalist, and I'm proud to be both. And by the way, happy Earth Day. And I want to talk about how being thrifty and saving the planet goes kind of hand in hand. But anyhow, this friend of mine questioned my credentials as a cheapskate when he found out that I only use disposable razors. Then I said, what do you expect? I never find the other kind in my neighbor's trash. Mm. Say, I ratchet it up. I ratchet it up to a whole new level of thrift. Now clearly we have some cheapskates as I've described you in the crowd today. Anybody want to fess up to it? They saw some thrift store yard sale. Okay, most people here are thrifty, and that's fine. I'm sure you are very thrifty. You're the kind of person that at the, at the holiday saves your wrapping paper, puts it back on the roll, uses it again next year. And I say bravo. Now me, I save it, I put it back on the roll, I take it back to Walmart for a refund. <laughs> no, I don't do that. See, that would be dishonest, and I said it before. That's just a joke. I don't, I don't do that. And I don't do dishonest things to save money, nor do the people that I write about. And, and I should have mentioned before that these are also the kind of people that I write about that don't spend every waking hour running hither and yon to save a nickel here and a nickel there so they can simply die with a bigger bank account. Again, these are people that understand what's important in life and, and uh, the role that money plays in that. But at any rate, um, uh, I don't do anything dishonest to save money, at least when, in my opinion, it's an important act of dishonesty. Here's something that I've done for most of my adult life, and now I guess it's no secret because I've written about it, but I don't drink a lot of uh, alcohol in my own life, but when my wife and I have uh, guests over for dinner, and we know they enjoy a glass of wine with dinner, we don't decant the wine we serve them, we recant it. And by that, I mean before they arrive, I have amassed a couple of empty premium label wine bottles out in the kitchen. Before they arrive, I take my five liter box of wine, funnel the cheap stuff into the expensive bottles, and serve it to them at the dinner table. And honestly, I've done this my whole adult life, and no one has ever questioned the authenticity of the wine that I serve, even if they are people who presumably know their wines. And I like to watch the, the initial reaction on their face when I, that, that for, they sort of grimace. But then, inevitably, they pick up the bottle, they look at it and they think, this is the really good stuff. My taste buds have to be off this evening. Now, I thought they looked at it to say, I'm not buying this one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it, too. But if you don't believe me, the University of Arizona, which I'll mention a couple times this afternoon, I did a study that proved just that. They took like a $5 bottle of wine. They said to people, this is $5 wine. What do you think of that? They took the same wine then later and said to people, this is $50 wine. What do you think of that? And you know, people liked it 10 times better when they thought it cost $50, it was, even though it was $5. Not I don't care what it costs. If I don't like the taste of it, I wouldn't buy it. Now, do you have some wine over here? Do you raise wine here? Uh, do I? No, I mean in this area. Oh, yeah, because yeah, yeah, okay. I know I told them in Yakima they didn't get much of a kick out of it. I stick with you. Yeah. Box wine, I call it cardboard. Oh. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, uh, I, I want to talk, uh, because sometimes I talk and I kind of forget to mention the, uh, the substance of the books that I wrote and so on. Um, and this is the first book I wrote called The Ultimate Chamber State's Roadmap to True Riches. And does anybody write here or want to write books or anything else? Some people, sure. And a lot of people want to. And, um, that's good. The, uh, uh, so I wrote that book and uh, started writing it in 2005. And if you think back to 2005, you remember that the economy was going gangbusters. Remember, we were all rich. Our houses were priceless. Stocks were going up. We knew that real estate only goes up in value, and the stock market only goes up in value. We knew these things to be, to be sacred. So I finished writing the book in 2005, but it takes forever for a book to come out. So it actually came out in late 2007. And if you think back to that time frame, you remember that's when we discovered everything we knew about money was apparently wrong. That houses could go down in value and that the stock market could go down in value. And so the book came out literally as the U.S. economy was imploding. In fact, some people blame the book for the Great Recession. Um, I think that's stretching it a bit. But uh, but at any rate, what started out as a, 
a funny little book about how to live better on less, um, it started getting a lot of people interested in this idea of, you know, we can't control necessarily how wealthy we are, how, how much our investments return, what our salary is, but we can control what we spend and consume every day within, within reason. And I don't write books about, um, as I like to say, I don't write books about how to get rich. I write books about how to get happy, perhaps with what you already have. So that book came out in late 2007, and a lot of people read it and contacted me as a result of it. And what I began to realize, the first book is about my odd little life and how I became the ultimate cheapskate and how my wife manages to, to put up with me. Um, and what I started hearing from people literally all around the world saying, we really see, we have a similar philosophy of life and money and happiness to you, but we have a different lifestyle. We're a family of six in rural Iowa, or we're a retired couple in Florida, or we're a single mom in, in Illinois. And what I started realizing that there was a certain breed of people, and again, I charitably call them cheapskates, who understand that there's more to life than just money. And they, they're very skilled at stretching their money. They're perfectly prepared to work hard and spend money on the stuff that they've decided is really important to them, but they're not going to be distracted by all the other stuff that people spend their money and time on that ultimately, in many cases, disappoints them. So with that, I set about writing the second book called The Cheapskate Next Door to extract from these people's uh, common experiences um, what they thought, not just about money. I mean, a lot of the questions in the survey, I surveyed about 320 of their household and interviewed almost 100 of them personally. But um, a lot of what uh, I polled them on was not just about money, but it was ultimately about happiness, how they spent their time, what they believed in, everything from the environment to religion. And I tried to, again, distill that all into the second book, The Chief Skate Next Door. And I want to talk just a little bit about that, because um, a lot of what I discovered was not particularly surprising, although it was highly unusual, particularly for people in our American culture today. We know that statistically. So one of the things I discovered was that these were obviously people who live within their means, always live below their means whenever they uh, could, even though they had a wide range of income uh, level. Some would be wealthy by any standard. Some had very modest uh, incomes. Secondly, uh, certainly a benchmark for these people was that, and this is important for Financial Literacy Month and so on, is these were people who simply didn't buy into this myth, and it is a myth, that you always have to be in debt in America to be comfortable and happy. Um, these were people who live by many old-fashioned rules, one of which was, if I can't afford to pay for it now, I simply can't afford it. So, I, so I'm not going to get it now if I can't afford to pay for it. And nothing awful happened because of that. Um, prepare for shock and awe. There was a study by um, the website creditloans.com now a couple of years ago, but it showed that the average American child today will spend more than $600,000 on interest during the course of their lifetime. $600,000 in interest, taking on their first debt as a child, as a minor, with a credit card backed by a parent or a car loan going on, and we know about student loan borrowing, to more car loans and more house loans and more credit cards and debt and debt and debt. Sadly, most Americans now will die um, owing money on their house or debt secured against their house. Cheapskates just don't believe that. We don't believe that debt is inevitable. Uh, in your life, and for us, the yoke of debt, the stress it provides on a daily basis is just unbearable, and we'll do anything to live debt-free. Now, in case you're wondering, the Chief Gates do believe in the dream of home ownership, and they're most, the vast majority, of course, need to take out a mortgage in order to buy a home. But once they do that, one, they usually buy a smaller home than they could afford, a less expensive home than they could afford to buy. They usually pay it off as quickly as they can. And they oftentimes buy a modest home when they're starting out and stay in that house for most or all of their lives. As one of them said, it was on the cusp of retirement, all my friends are scurrying around to downsize. We never upsized in the beginning. And because of that, she was able to retire at 42 or something like that. 
um, again, trading off some material possessions for the comfort of time. So uh, those are some of the big things behind these people. Um, the word self kept coming up when I talk to these people. Um, that one, they tend to be very self-reliant. They prefer to learn how to do something for themselves rather than pay somebody else to do something for them. And again, that's not just about saving money. It's about the fact that they would rather have a broader life experience and learn new skills and save some money in the process. They tend to have a lot of self-esteem. As you can well imagine, they're not going to buy a designer item or an item to simply try to impress others. They'll, by the way, pay more for something if they think the value and the durability is there, so they don't shop just based on price, but they're not in the prestige. Uh, they're not worried about keeping up with the Joneses. In fact, as one of them told me, the Joneses can kiss our assets for all we care. Um, the, uh, they also have, uh, as I say, they're self-actualized and the, again, they've sit in the, they sat down and took a good look at what's important to them in life and what they really want and they're prepared to work for that but not for the other things. But interestingly enough, these people are not selfish. In fact, of the 320 households I surveyed, they tended to give about twice as much money away, be it to charity or family members or friends, as the average um, American does. So they were charitable uh, in that sense. Um, some of the things I discovered that uh, people kind of, kind of found interesting was that, uh, let me say this up front, that there's, I, I concluded early on that there's no one best way to thrift. It's whatever works for you. And people say, what about yard sales? What about big box stores? What about dollar stores? What about coupons? And what I found was that all these people had different means. Some swore by coup using coupons, others swore against using coupons. And the one thing I discovered about my cheapskates was that however they do it is, trust me, the best way to do it. Because they'll tear into you trying to convince you of their way of thrift. So whatever works for you, there are a lot of different paths uh, to thrift. I ask the question, because I get the question all the time, do you ever splurge on anything? And 100%, everyone in my survey said, we absolutely do splurge on things. But one, they probably do it less often than the average American does. Secondly, they prefer to have it be a guilt-free splurge, so that they like to save the money for something in advance a discretionary item in advance, so that if they go on that trip of a lifetime, they can enjoy it. They, they know they're not coming home to all the credit card bills, which they can't pay for it. And, and to that end, they were much more likely to splurge on experiences as opposed to material objects. And there's a lot of social science that, that backs this up, that says that basically, if you look at happiness, experiences tend to stay with us and increase, even increase in value over time. Material objects tend to disappoint us over time and often drop in value, both emotional and financially. Uh, they often drop in value. So, so cheap guys were much more likely to say if we splurge, it's going to be for an experience. And those experiences need not be expensive. Um, it can be that trip around the world, the once in a lifetime trip, or it can be something as simple as as getting together with family or friends. I also found, by the way, and in fact, to that end, they were twice as likely to have traveled outside the United States as the, as the average American. Um, I also found, by the way, that they were half as likely to get a divorce as an average American. Now, you could say that's too, because they're too cheap to get a divorce, but, <laughs> but that really, that really wasn't, the, wasn't the case. Um, these were people who had, uh, many had very long-term successful relationships. Oftentimes, by the way, they marry their polar opposite. So a cheapskate doesn't always marry a fellow cheapskate. In about half the cases, they married somebody who felt quite differently about money. But their relationships tended to last because one, they communicated about money openly in their marriage, and two, because there was at least one cheapskate in the marriage, they tended to have fewer financial problems, particularly debt hanging over their heads. So that's a snapshot of the cheapskates, and if you can indulge me for a minute, I want to ask three quick questions of the audience to advance kind of the body of cheapskate knowledge here. You're participating in live research on this Earth Day. 
Um, I, I noticed that for whatever reason, and I don't claim to know the reason, chief gates tend to love their pets. They tend to be more likely than the average American to own a pet. Raise your hand if you've ever owned a cat or dog. Keep your hands up if you only own cats or dogs that were adopted from a, a pound or rescued as a stray. Congratulations. Uh, we have a, a, lot of, a, a lot of good cheapskates here. Cheapskates were 100 times, not double, but 100 times more likely to only own cats or dogs that were adopted or found as a stray. As a, as a stray. And again, that's not just about saving money, but I argue in this case it's sort of an altruistic act on their part as well. Secondly, I'm, I'm bicycling around, I'm a big bicyclist, so I'm bicycling around the country, staying with these cheapskates to interview them for the book, uh, The Cheapskate Next Door. And I love to cook. I've written about, I think, cooking in all uh, four of my books. And so I'm happy to help out in the kitchen with the evening meal. And I start to notice that all these cheapskates, without exception, have in their kitchen a kind of an old-fashioned appliance that they love and that they use all the time. And I realize that I feel the same about mine. And that appliance is the electric crock pot. And I see some heads shake. We have some crock stars here. I can say there's some crocket going on. There's some good crocket going on. And so I had to go back and survey these people again because I realized I love my crock pot. And it makes a lot of sense because a crock pot is very economical. It's like two, it literally like two cents of electricity per hour. Great way to turn inexpensive ingredients and the big batch meals that you could freeze the leftovers of. The USD. The USDA says that, that almost half of the American food budget now is spent on meals prepared outside the home, either restaurant meals or carryout. Cheapskates are eating kind of more like in the 1960s or 70s, where only about 10% of their budget is spent on that. So they're cooking a lot more uh, at home, and they're, they're loving their crock pot. Raise your hand if you have a crock pot. Keep your hand up if you own two or more crack pots. Keep your hand up if you own three or more crack pots. Congratulations, ma'am. All indications are, oh, you are surrounded by, yes. On, on average, the chief gay households own three crack pots. As I like to say, if chief gays were a tribe, the crock pot would be our totem. <laughs> Love the crock pots. And I, I, how many do you have? Three. Three, okay. You fit the profile. By the way, everyone should have raised their hand when it comes to crock pot. I don't know if anybody didn't, but okay. everyone owns it. Ma'am, you're going to go home. Look, top cover uh, where you've never been in I your got kitchen. I got it for a wedding guest, and I moved it on someplace else. So <laughs> everybody <laughs> has one. Everybody has one. Uh, it's different but, sizes uh, for different projects. Yes, yes. And here's the, here's the winner of that question on the survey, where three households tied for top crock honors owning an incredible eight crock pots per house. I mean, I don't know if they do laundry anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Okay, in fairness, some of them were people who had like obligations for church or civic groups and, and or big family reunions. One guy was just a crock pot order. <laughs> Pay 50 cents for it, Jeff. I'm not going to pass that for 50 cents. I don't want that. So, here's a quick crock pot tip, yeah, and it'll work with your climate here. As the winter is coming on, I like to keep a crock pot filled to the top with water set on low in the bedroom to add heat and humidity. It's really a very economical way to do that. And plus, when you have house guests, they're like, what are the Jaegers into? They got a crock pot in the bedroom. <laughs> The last question is, is kind of hard to follow, but it's pretty interesting, and, and it's skewed somewhat by the age of the audience, but I think this will work. It's a little wonder that the chief's case live by the old-fashioned rules like use it up, wear it out, make it last, and in some cases do without. As I mentioned before, they're prepared to pay more for something if they think the quality justifies it, particularly the durability. If it'll last longer, then they do the math. And one guy explained to me at length, I won't get into it, why men should buy boxer shorts rather than briefs, because they pay for themselves over time. And trust me, he knew it. He, he could draw a Venn diagram of, of that. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so they tend to buy quality things used whenever possible. They like to let somebody else pay depreciation, so they'll buy it at the yard sale or at the, uh, the thrift store. And they take care of their possessions um, over time. 
And they do that, by the way, not, you know, we talk about an asset appreciating in value. Some of us think about that when we go to buy a house. Most people probably do. Is this a good investment or not? But short of that, most of us don't ever really think about that. But cheapskates are always doing this math to see if the durability will justify the price and will it stand any chance of increasing in value, which is one reason they had a proclivity for antique furniture, not priceless antiques but something that might actually hold its value over time. So I started talking to him about their clothing, and I asked him, what's the oldest piece of clothing that you have and you at least still occasionally wear? I can see the wheels are turning now. So raise your hand if you own and at least occasionally wear a piece of apparel that goes all the way back to when Barack Obama was president. All the way back to when George, Bush, George W. Bush was president. All the way back to Bill Clinton being president. Bush won. Now we're into the Reagan years, 1980s. Some hands drop. Jimmy Carter, late 1970s. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. You you are a cheapskate. <laughs> yeah, it's still be So what do you have? I actually have a coat that I had in high school in the 50s. It still fits, and I use it for shoveling snow. It's got a hood on. Nice. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. The winner of that question on the survey was actually a guy who I think has you beat. His he owns and regularly wears two wool red shirts that his father bought during the FDR administration. <laughs> I think it was FDR who said we have nothing to fear but oh, fashion I had a itself. That my dad wore it. He died in '72, and my husband wore it till two years ago before he got put in an institution. So yeah, nice. That was one out. Yeah. Good, good, good for you. So that's a snapshot of the cheap states that I write about. Um, and again, before I move on to uh, briefly discussing a couple of, uh, of exercises you might want to try, let me again encourage you to think that when I say cheap state, it's not about sacrifice or deprivation. It's about pausing. Whenever we do that thing, we do every day. We open up our purse, we get out our wallet, and we decide what we're going to spend our money on. You know, that's why a cheap state like me, I don't get out my wallet very often or very easily. Oh, my Woodstock oh, ticket! My Woodstock <laughs> ticket! <laughs> I knew I, let me get a drink of water before I dive into this next item. You have to forgive me. I didn't. This is a bottle of water. I don't buy a bottle of water. I'll talk about that in a minute. Oh no! Wait a minute. I met the president of Walgreens, and he, when his wife and daughters go to bed, he refill the bottles and put them back in the refrigerator. Nice. Good for yeah. him. Somebody Back said, Jeff, do you buy a bottle of water? I said, I don't even buy a bottle of wine. <laughs> <laughs> That's how bad it is. In my first, I want to talk just super briefly about two, two little exercises that might help you, or if you, you're mostly practicing cheapskates, if you know anybody, anybody who's not a cheapskate, this might help them. The first is something I wrote about in my first book. It's called The Fiscal Fast, Fiscal Fasting. I challenge people to go for a week out of every year without spending any money. No cash, no credit cards, no debit cards, uh, no checks. Just get money out of your life entirely for a week. And there's no, by the way, there's no stocking up in advance. Don't rush out the week ahead of time and buy everything you need. You can top off the gas can tank with uh, gas, pick up some milk for the kids, but this is the week that we're really go shopping in our own home and use up the stuff we have uh, on hand. The USDA says that, again, about 40% of all the food that Americans buy ends up getting thrown away. Much of it, by the way, is still good when we throw it away. The rest we've allowed to spoil. So when people say, how can I reduce my food bill? Well, if you're in that demographic, and I suspect most of you are, but you could reduce your food bill by arguably 40% by being smarter about portion control and food preservation. The week of the fiscal fast is the week that we'll make our fun as a family rather than give everybody 10 bucks or 20 bucks to go to the Cineplex with. It's the week we'll break out the board games we haven't played for so long. And I've heard as a result of writing about this in my book from all kinds of families across the country saying, you know, that was the best part about not spending money for a week when we spent time together as a family. It's the week where we'll do something really radical like try to carpool to work or telecommute. You know, I live in the Washington, D.C. area, worst commuting traffic in the country, and we're all very smart. We know it makes sense to carpool, well, for the other guys to carpool. Me, I can't do it. But here's the thing about the, the fiscal fast. It's just a week out of your life. Try to shake it up and do these things and see what the impact is. You might be surprised. 
It's also the week where we'll finally use up those little bottles of shampoo that we've been saving from the Motel 6 for all those years. You can do it, wash your hair every day for about a week with one of those. Actually, I'm up to about a month with my <laughs> receding hairline. So a fiscal fast will allow you to do three things. One, you're going to save some money during the week. Now, don't take the money you save and rush out and spend it. Use it to pay down debt or put it into savings. Secondly, the fiscal fast week is a great week to get your household budget in order or to put one in place if you don't have one. And speaking briefly about the budgets of the cheapskates, again, it's kind of an un-American model. The cheapskates tend to spend about half of their income on the true necessities of life, food, clothing, shelter. And these are people who have a very clear understanding of what's a need, what's a necessity, and what's a want, what's a discretionary item. They do spend about 20% of their income on discretionary um, items, things that they fully admit that they don't need, but that they want. And again, that goes to the issue of they're prepared to spend on the things that they want, but not on the things that distract others. And then they take a whopping 30% of their income and put it into savings uh, and or into, as I mentioned before, giving, whether it's charitable or otherwise. Come on in. Um, so that's, a, that's the cheapskate budget in a nutshell. And third and finally, the, the fiscal fast will give us all a chance to remember that there's so many great things in life that just don't involve spending any money. So that's the first thing is a fiscal fast. The second, lay, uh, second thing is something I've written about in a number of books. It's called, What the Heck Was I Thinking Audit? What the heck was I thinking? Do it twice a year. In fact, you can do it the same week you're doing the fiscal fast since you're sort of channeling your your cheapskate at that point. So the what the heck was I thinking audit is a simple exercise. Sit down at the kitchen table, break out your credit card statements, receipts for major purpose, purchases, your canceled checks. Look through each expenditure and ask yourself one simple question. If I had it to do over again, would I spend that money in that way? If the answer is no, put it on your list and refer back to the list often. Over time, trust me, you will put, be buying fewer and fewer things that you later regret. There was a study a few years ago that showed that, the, believe it or not, Americans express regrets about 80% of the discretionary items that they buy. And in fairness, maybe it's not total regret, maybe we'd even buy it again, but I think we all know that feeling of buyer's remorse. And so this is just an attempt to kind of rein in um, the money that we spend that later we regret. And again, oftentimes people say, well, what are you giving up to be a cheapskate? I like to think my folks are giving up some portion of that 80% that ultimately isn't going to make them happy even if, they, even if they buy it. So try to learn from your mistakes with that. You know, it's not hard to say the craziness of this uh, sort of uh, out of control spending spree that Americans have been on. Each year for the past 50 years, per capita consumption in America has increased by about 1%. So we now consume, as individuals, 50% more stuff than we did 50 years ago. There's no indication that's made us any happier. Uh, it certainly has made us unhappier if we can't afford it. It's certainly been harder on the earth, but yet the consumption goes on. So I came up with this theory called contra-economics. And contra-economics is my theory that the vast majority of discretionary spending in America is not only unnecessary and nonsensical, but in many cases, it cancels itself out on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis. Here's a real-life example. Every year in America, believe it or not, we spend $2 billion with a B trying to remove unwanted body hair with bikini waxes and stuff like that. Every year in America, we spend $2 billion trying to promote hair growth with Rogaine and products like that. So I guess the good news is, as a nation, we believe we have the right amount of hair. The bad news is location, location, location. Uh, Okay, then. <laughs> now I know what you've been thinking. It's such a beautiful library. You're thinking, but they couldn't even get the trash can out of the speaker's way. Not to worry. This is my traveling trash can. We've all got a lot of, a lot of time together. 
If you were to ask an archaeologist what's the most important artifact that a civilization leaves behind, they're probably not going to say it's their art or their architecture or their religion. You're right. Thank you. It's their garbage. The contents of a civilization's trash or an individual's trash tells you more about the life they lead than anything else they leave behind. That was the epiphany I had one day, and the idea of a trash can autopsy was born. And I'd like to perform a live trash can autopsy for you here today. My contention is very simple. If I were to go home with any of you after the talk today, and I'm available to do so, and if I were to look through your trash, or the combination of your trash and your recycling bin, I've lumped it here uh, together today, I could find ways that you're wasting hundreds of dollars, but in all likelihood, thousands of dollars every year just by what your trash has to tell me. So I'm really quite serious about this. Go home, dump it out on the living room floor, and have a look at it. Now, if you're like most Americans, you're going to find most of your trash is going to look like this, packaging. Packaging, packaging, packaging. We've gone packaging crazy in America. I mean, we've just gone packaging crazy in America. Now, some of you are my age or maybe a bit older. You can remember a time when there wasn't so much packaging. And you remember how awful our lives were? <laughs> so the lesson is very simple. Obviously, buy in bulk, buy the right size for you, and avoid elaborate packaging. We're smart enough to know that ultimately we're paying for this. Not, there's not a charitable foundation. If you see a lot of logos, brand names in your trash, it means you got to try the generics and save 50, 20 to 50 percent. Here's something I have to show you. When I, I bought this only for the sake of my demonstrations. When I bought it a few week, years ago, it contained 24 miniature brand muffins, just mini muffins. And I bought it because it was the most extreme case of overpackaging I'd ever seen. Each mini muffin was individually wrapped in cellophane. It was placed in one of these trays. The tray was placed in the clamshell. The clamshell was, she was sealed and then plastic wrapped, shrink wrapped. And when I bought it, I paid $7.99 for the 24 miniature brand muffins. When I went all embarrassed to pay for it to the cashier and I paid for it, I started walking out of the store. The cashier yells, wait, sir, you'll need a bag for that. So apparently the packaging, I mean, all I could conclude was the muffins must be very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> I kept the pressure that way, too. Well, at $7.90 now, now, I'm a great cook, and I would say that the ingredients cost of the brand muffins was maybe 50 cents. We pay $7.99 for it, not because this packaging costs that much more, but because it's so elaborately packaged, we're convinced that it's worth the value. Uh, so avoid the elaborate packaging. By the way, if you have a clamshell, don't throw it away. It makes a great miniature greenhouse to raise seedlings in before the growing season starts outdoors. One of the last books I wrote was a book called, uh, a little tip book called Don't Throw That Away. By the way, in, as I was writing that, I also wrote this book, which is How to Retire the Cheapskate Way, which deals with the topic of retirement for people at any age, whether you're a young adult just starting out in your career or whether you've been retired for 20 years. But then I wrote this book, Don't Throw That Away, which is a tip book about how to reuse stuff that you might otherwise throw away or recycle. And I try to make in that book the, the point repeatedly that none of the stuff in that book is going to make you rich. Reusing a baggie, reusing a piece of tinfoil. I've done the math. It's not going to make you rich. It's not even going to save you that much money during the course of your lifetime. But I believe you should do it nonetheless because it takes only a second and it instills what I call an ethic of thrift. It makes you think about not wasting stuff, not wasting money. And when you have that mindset, then your life will change. Then you will save a lot of money because it makes wasting money on the big things that much harder. It's also much easier on the earth to reuse this stuff. So keep that in mind. Some of these tips seem wacky, but uh, but I think they're worth doing. Hang on to some of these sturdy mesh bags. I love to put the swimsuits on them on the way back from the beach in the, in the summertime. I'm a big fisherman. I have a big one of these. I put it on my waders to keep my fish in when I'm fishing. You can take something like some old balls of tin foil, put it in the bag, and it makes a great pot scrubber. Did you know that you can take those bowls of tin foil and put them in the dryer and they magically reduce static clang? Can you imagine what it's like to live with me? <laughs> Here's some stuff you're going to like.
How many people garden here? Any gardeners? Okay. Composting? You compost? Good. A rind is a terrible thing to waste, as they say. So even if you don't compost, never, and it's Earth Day, so I have to, have to hit on that a bit, but never ever put organic material in a, in a plastic bag and send it to the landfill. It, it can take up to a thousand years for the bag to decompose. The banana peel inside will decompose in two weeks at the most. So don't Unfortunately, do that. if you just drop it in your garbage, then your garbage smells. So I'm, I'm doing that now because I'm alone, and if i got something on, I put it in an old plastic bag in my garbage, uh -huh. so the whole house doesn't smell. Yeah, well, I like the smell of garbage. but. <laughs> but, uh, but it's something as simple as a banana peel, I mean, they're high, as an example, they're high in potassium, so if you have a rose bush, just cut it up, stir it in the soil around the rose bush. Rose bushes love potassium, uh, and, and there's oils in this that deters aphids that love to eat roses, so you're ahead. You don't have a rose bush. I know you're saying, Jeff, great, that's brilliant, but I don't have a rose bush. You probably have a house plant. You can use the pulpy side to shine the leaves of your house plants with. It puts a really nice shine on them, and again, it deters aphids. You can also use a banana peel to shine your shoes with, the pulpy side of it. Um, and here's one that I didn't know until recently. You can take a piece of banana peel, get a piece like this. You can put it pulpy side first on your teeth for five minutes a week, and it will magically and naturally whiten your teeth. And somebody said, Jeff, does that actually work? And I said, I don't know. But after you've walked around the house like this and you take it off, they look really white, don't they? Huh? Compared to this? I think, they, I think they look very white. Audience participation time. What I have here. I bought it. Now, if I've been doing a trash can autopsy and I find an empty container for something like these shredded carrots from the grocery store, we'll have to have a little chat. I bought these only for my demonstration. I've been carrying them for a week now, so they're starting to decompose a bit in my trash can. This is 12 ounces of shredded carrots. I think I paid $2 or something for them as a, for my demonstration. Now, we're all very smart. We know when we go to the grocery store, you go to the produce section, you can buy whole produce for a lesser price, or you can pay something extra for the convenience of having your produce processed. In this case, whole carrots versus shredded carrots, or a whole head of lettuce, or a bag of shredded lettuce for you, or a, wa a whole watermelon, or a cut up watermelon, because the cutting of watermelon is, is really quite an art. It's not easily done. So we know we're paying something extra for the convenience of having our, our carrot shredded, but I don't think we have any idea how much extra we're paying. Now, listen carefully, and I have a, I'm sorry, I have a hard time explaining this. The University of Arizona did a study that computed out on a per hour basis, in essence, how much you're paying somebody to shred your carrots. So it's the difference in the cost between a pound or 12 ounces of whole carrots versus the cost of 12 ounces of shredded carrots and the small amount of time involved to transform the whole carrots into shredded carrots. They computed that out on a per hour basis. Now, I buy, so who can guess the, the closest without going over the amount that you're paying somebody on a per hour basis to shred your carrots, and I have a very nice prize for the person who comes closest. How much? $22. $22? $22? See, now, I, again, that might be how, uh, how much somebody gets to actually shred carrots, although that would be a pretty good wage, but that's not what I'm after. I'm after, in essence, how much you're paying. Oh. Because it's the difference in the markup. That's low. Anybody have a guess? $59. $59. She thinks this price is right. She wants to be exact. $59.01. <laughs> no, that's a good guess. Any other guesses? That's low? $0.40. Cents. How much? $0.40. $0.46. No, that's no, low. No, $0.06. $0.40. Cents. Mm -hmm. No. $64. $64. Okay, I'm going to give you the price. The answer is actually $160 an hour. 
$160 an hour. Again, that's the little amount of time that's, that it takes to shred the carrots, given the markup in the cost. And I think the most bizarre example, the most extreme example, was actually, do you have whole pounds of butter here that you can buy in the store, or the quarter pounds? Mm -hmm. If you price the two against each other, you'll see it's an astronomical markup for quartering your butter. So you you won the prize, and I have an ultimate cheapskate iPad for you this today. <laughs> Huh? You can tell your daughter that you can tell your daughter if she's good, you have an iPad for her. <laughs> Now, I really do this, but you have been a really nice group. So if you ever want your carrots shredded, call me. I'll come to your house for 100 bucks an hour and shred your carrots. See what I have here? It's a little stump of a head of romaine lettuce. I love romaine lettuce. Absolutely love it. When you get it down to just the stump, whatever you do, don't throw that away. You can put a clean cut on the bottom of that, set it in a shallow pan of water, and it will grow new leaves of romaine lettuce. You can eventually root it in the garden if you want or just keep growing them like this. You can do the same with bok choy and spring onions and so on. So while I love romaine lettuce, I believe every American should only buy one head of it during their lifetime. <laughs> and some people think this is strange, but when I go to a wedding sometimes, I like to give the bride and groom a head of romaine lettuce. And when I explain it's romaine lettuce for their entire marriage, they, they think I'm pretty generous. <laughs> I thought you were going to tell me to come back in 10 years and see what they have. Okay, let's keep going here. Anybody like to camp out there? Yes, there's beautiful areas for camping. Save one of your plastic coffee cans, put a slit in it, use it to keep your toilet paper in when you go camping. You'll be very popular with some rainy morning in the campground. As they say, everybody's an adult until somebody breaks out oh, the I bubble wrap. Oh, I you would lay down on the floor of your office and walk around barefoot. Yeah. Amazon. Okay. Um, here's a quick tip. As the winter's coming on, if you have some windows in your house that you don't look through, like in a garage or, or basement that are uninsulated, take a spray bottle of water, lightly mist the inside of the window pane facing in towards the, the interior of the house, cut a piece of bubble wrap to fit it, lightly press the bubble wrap, bubble side first, against the window pane. It will clean layer magically all winter long, add insulation to the window, and peel off neat and clean in the springtime, guaranteed. So next time you come to my house, you'll know you've arrived because we have the bubble wrap on the windows. We've gone packaging crazy. Uh, crazy in America, we've also gone cleanser crazy. There's all these different cleaning products. I mean, this is for porcelain in the in the bathroom, this is for porcelain in the kitchen, and whatever you do, you must buy both of these. Because we remember growing up in a household where mom had, you know, water, Windex, vinegar, baking soda, maybe some bleach. You remember how filthy our houses were? No. So we go back to the future and the cheapskates and we use some of these old-fashioned products, which by the way, again for Earth Day, things like baking soda and vinegar are actually more environmentally drain sensitive. Drive, yeah, drain. yeah, more environmentally sensitive than even some of the green cleaning products that you buy that cost more. So you could clean your drains with it. We know we can cure bee stings and bug bites and upset stomachs with it. We can brush our teeth with it, we can use it as deodorant, we can use it to soften our hair, we can use it to soften our clothing, we can clean every surface in our our house with baking soda. We all know to keep a box in the refrigerator, but here's what you probably don't know. After a month or so in the refrigerator, your baking soda is going to be shot. Whatever you do, don't throw that away. Next time you're baking some cookies or a pie in the oven, the oven's already hot, sprinkle the baking soda on a cookie sheet and bake it for about a half hour at 350 degrees, and it will be as good as new. It brings it back to life. Baking soda comes back? Yes. So, I believe every American should only buy one box, 350 for half an hour. And again, when we go to a wedding, if I really like the couple, I give the romaine and I give the baking soda as lifetime gifts. I do. I really do. Here's a confession I have to make. 
I have my own little indulgences. I convinced myself years ago that if I don't eat the same brand of yogurt, a six ounce cup in the same fashion every day, awful things will happen to me. And I know I'm wasting money. I shouldn't buy a brand name. I should make my own yogurt, or at least should buy it in a bigger container. But this is what I do, and so it's my indulgence, and nothing awful's ever happened to me, so I guess it's working. So this is my six ounce cup of yogurt. I go to the refrigerator the other day, I open it up, I look inside, and it just doesn't look like there's very much in there. And sure enough, I've been the victim of what I call stealth product downsizing. It's very common for manufacturers to keep the container size the same, put less inside, and change, charge the same for it, or, or even more. So obviously you prevent it by looking at the per unit cost on the, on the label at the store. But I have to give this manufacturer's marketing department really high marks. It's gone from 6 ounces to 5.4, but they've turned it into a positive saying now with 10% fewer calories. <laughs> Speaking of marketing, of course, one of the biggest rip-offs of all time is bottled water. New York Times says that if you drank only bottled water for a year and got the amount of water that you should have for a healthy diet, you spend about $1,200 on the water. You could have a year's worth of tap water for under 50 50 cents. And that's more of a store brand of water. It's not a brand name like this Avion, I think was like $2,100 for a year supply. And we do realize that this is the word naive spelled backwards. <laughs> no, it, 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 honest to God, it is the word naive spelled backwards. I mean, that's that marketing department thinking, how are we going to get people to pay $2,100 for 50 cents worth of water? So you're at the Motel 6, you got the shower cap, and you save it, and you use it to cover your leftovers when you get home. Glad makes something like that now. You know, we talked about stealth product downsizing. It's very common with cereals to do that all the time. We're putting less and less in the box. You've got these indestructible bags. I don't know what was wrong with the old wax paper bags we used to get, but you've got these hang on to them. They're great to use in the freezer to keep things in. And I know what you're saying, Jeff, that's a great idea, but how will I seal the bag? See what I have here is the top of a plastic bottle. I think it was like a chocolate milk bottle. I've cut that off. And if you want to seal a bag, and it works great with bread wrappers, put your romaine in there or whatever, you want to seal, push the opening of the bag up through there till you have a down where you want it, and then put that plastic lid back on the top. It makes an airtight seal on the bag. Once again, can you imagine what it's like to live with me? <laughs> I get this question all the time, and I and others have done the math. When it comes to paper towels and paper napkins versus cloth, you will, in fact, the average household come out about $250 a head by using cloth, and that includes the cost to launder the cloth napkins and uh, cloth towels. So, now, if you have something like that in your trash, you've got a bigger problem than what I'm talking about. I know across Washington, some places are outlawing these, some aren't. Do you still have these plastic bags? Okay, you still do. I know a lot of places have outlawed them. American consumers spend about $4 billion a year. Uh, these obviously, in the end, you're paying for them. So the lesson is simple, refuse to take and bring your own bags. Many places now give you a discount if you bring your own bags, yes? Do you have any ideas for, like when I clean up the cat box, that's specifically right. what I use those for. So what can I do instead if I'm going to get making Well, at least you're making use of them. Um, right. the, the reality is, is that 95% of these actually end up in the landfill, except those that blow against my fence in the yard. Um, very few of them get recycled. There's an economic disadvantage to recycling. At least you're reusing them. I know a lot of people who find trash cans with them. And speaking of reusing them. But does that uh, mean the cat litter will last for a million years inside those? The bag is going to decompose somewhat faster, but it's still. I okay. So a uh, cheapskate friend of mine made this indestructible tote bag for my groceries that's made out of these plastic bags. It's a process called PLARN, like plastic, R-P-L-A-R-N. If you Google it, there's instructions on how to make that. Let me pass that around. I'm so pleased with how The only thing is that it, it, it stretches after a while, too. 
Now, if I'm doing a trash can on top, see, I find some of this. Dryer lint, the cheapskate smell of it. I'll know that, like most Americans, you're over laundering your clothes. Americans launder at an incredible rate. We're one of the, if not the only developed country that wears out its clothing more from laundering than from wear and tear. So the lessons are simple launder and cold, launder less often, most of all. When you can, avoid the electric clothes dryer because this is a life of your clothing being beaten and cooked out of it. Oh, it's the cat here. It's, yes. it's, uh, the average family of four would save about 250 bucks a year again on, on line drying their clothes in, the, in terms of the savings on the cost of the dryer. But the big savings is this, your clothing will last about 50% longer. If you have some, don't throw it away. It's very flammable. Put it in a toilet paper tube. Use it to light the wood stove or campfire with. Put it out for the birds to use for nesting. Right. Well, they get some from here. Now, if I'm going through your trash and I find your, your 2016 calendar, I'll know you're definitely not a cheapskate because did you know that all calendars eventually become good again? <laughs> they go through a cycle. You go to a website that, honest to God, is called When Can I Reuse This Old Calendar? dot com, and it will show you a schedule of when you can reuse these. Oh, where are you got storage in wave twenty. Plenty of storage isn't a problem. Plenty of storage space. Let's see. My wife and I don't dine out often, but when we go, we like to get Chinese carry out because at least it comes with a plate. Do you know this? Does anybody know this? I never knew this. These are made to fold out specifically into like a shallow plate bowl that you're to eat out of. Did you ever know that? I mean, all these years we've lived with these boxes. Don't you think they would put that on the box? Of course, maybe that's what that says. I don't know. <laughs> so sometimes we get a full set of china when we go to a wedding. Plug for local libraries, a family of four will save $250 a year by buying, uh, by reading their periodicals and newspapers at the library or online and borrowing their books there. By the way, if you're getting a lot of junk mail, which is in there too, go to the website 41pounds, 41pounds.org to get taken off those lists. 41 pounds is the amount of junk mail the average American receives in a year. Is that, is that in the catalogs? Is that the website to get off of catalogs? You can get off of catalogs. And it's what, four? Four, four one, the letter, yeah. four one pounds. LBS, the word no, spelled pounds. out. No, spelled out. Spelled out, pounds.org. <coughs> couple extras. See what I have here? My wife's old pantyhose. I guess pantyhose are going to become a thing of the past. I don't know what I'll do once they are, because I have a million uses for them. Again, as a gardener, I like to cut them into rubber bands to stake up tomato plants with. If you're not a gardener, you'd no doubt buy potatoes and onions from the grocery store. When you get them home, take them out of the bag, drop them into the pantyhose, and hang them in the pantry. The increased airflow circulation will keep them fresher, fresh longer. Potatoes and onions? Potatoes and onions. And, and again, when it, the great thing is when you have house guests and they look at your pantry and they see these lumpy pairs of legs, and then there's the crock pot in the bedroom, one of the gators. <laughs> they leave really quick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I learned one in Chicago. Okay. Catholic orphanage uh, would tie little kids uh, to the, the, their baby bed because they wouldn't hurt them. They oh, pulled. okay. And they Tie your oh. kids up with many of us. One thousand and two uses. You know what else is good for gardening? It's the shower rings. You can catch them at yard sales for really cheap. That's how I do all my berries. Oh, that's right. Tie them up with the shower rings. With the shower rings. Because they have enough yeah. room to move. You know, sure. they're not, you're not cutting off. Anything. Nice. Great idea. Yeah, I store my potatoes in the bathtub. In patio house or? No, <laughs> just in the paper box. With the air going through. Old cheese at box. You may be a hook cool. right there. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got That's a good title. So here's a, here's a daily double. Take those little pieces of soap that you don't know what to do with them. Shower, drop them into the pantyhose, and then you can get all the suds out. I keep those tied up by the garden hose outside, or when I'm in a special mood, I wear them in the shower as a cheapskate soap on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one for you, too, okay. that I learned back um, for storing, like, um, salsa or odd, any of the tomato things. In the refrigerator, 
put them in the refrigerator upside down because you create a new seal. Right. Yeah, so storing can air, you do the same with sour cream, will last much longer if it's stored, so it creates a vacuum in there. So I've got just a couple more for you. Can you keep a little secret? Something as simple as an empty deodorant container doesn't go to waste at my house. I use it when I travel as a little travel safe to keep some spare cash and a credit card in. Because I'm thinking, who in the world would steal the ultimate cheapskates deodorant? <laughs> The movie last night, they were smuggling out uh, jewels uh, on a uh, shaving, shaving cream container. Oh, huh. Jewels so smuggling, tie your kids up with a pantyhose and yes. smuggle. <laughs> Here's a tip for you. I mentioned razors before. We all know that if we keep our razor blades dry, they last about five times longer because they go dull from oxidation, from rust, more than from use. But here's one I didn't know about razors that really works. If you have a razor that's like a multi-track like that, and you think it's dull, try doing this. Push it against your skin just a few times, and it will magically appear to be sharp again. My theory is it isn't sharpening the blades, it's realigning the blades. I'm guessing the manufacturers have decided, you know, we'll get these so that they're out of alignment soon and people will buy more razors. But this really works, um, at least the first mm -hmm. couple of times. The guy who showed it to me at one of my talks, I didn't believe it at the time, but he showed me how to do this, and he had incredibly hairy arms. And I'm thinking, buddy, you could you could sharpen a machete on your arms. <laughs> but actually, it, it doesn't require much hair. It actually works. <laughs> Two more. Now, you're going to go home and you're going to do this, your trash can autopsy. But before you do that, first run into the kitchen and get your package of grape Kool-Aid. And then run into the bathroom take the lid out of the tank of the toilet, sprinkle some of the grape Kool-Aid in the water in the toilet tank, not the bowl, but the tank. Wait an hour without flushing the toilet, and if when you come back in, there's purple water in the toilet bowl, it means you have a slow leak, one you can't even hear with your ears, but one that's easily fixed and is wasting money. Regardless, you're gonna have a great smelling bathroom for about a week. And last but not least, it all comes back to box wine, the card Bordeaux. If you drink wine, this is environmentally the most sensitive way to drink it. Economically, it's the most money efficient way to drink it. But most of all, it's like a box of Cracker Jack that comes with a little prize inside this bag, inside the box of wine. There's a lot of things you can do with this. I'm trying to save up enough to make a water bag out of it. I don't know if my liver will last. Again, if you're a gardener, you can make what's called a water pillow or nursery pillow out of it. Fill this bag with water. You can do that by putting a slit here, filling it with water, put duct tape over it, and then it's a slow drip irrigation system. So set it out next to a plant that you've just transplanted and drip on it. Or the best thing you can do with one of these things is to make an inflatable travel pillow. Let me tell you, next time you get on a crowded United Airlines flight <laughs> and you sit down in your seat and start blowing this up, the big guy in the seat next to you is going to get up and move and you'll have that much more space to spread out. Okay, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, that's the end of my little demonstration. Um, I look forward to any questions you have or tips to share with me. You've got some good ones. Kool-Aid. Kool-Aid. For uh, young mothers with little kids. I had a little angel there stuff something in her nose. The first time to the doctor's office. The second time I took a sauce dish and I shook the Kool-Aid in the dish and it made her sneeze. Huh. So it's like it's like pepper. It makes mm -hmm. her sneeze. Yeah. Like, oh, but pepper cool. could burn the eyes. Yeah. Yeah. But That's the Kool-Aid made her sneeze. You've got a lot of them. Potatoes in your bathtub and <laughs> kids tied up with pantyhose. <laughs> so you retired pretty early. Uh -huh. What did you do about health insurance and what are you seeing people doing about health insurance yeah, these days? Obviously that's a big topic and my wife my wife is retired now. She wasn't retired when I started writing for a living, but um, we buy health insurance on the open market and I, I wrote about it in at least in my retirement book, uh, and particularly for people who wanted to retire uh, early. And of course, the landscape is changing on health insurance. But in general, the way my chief's case did it, the way I do it, is to buy a very high deductible mm -hmm. plan, sort of betting on yourself. Um, I also have written a lot about the issue of health, not just health care, but 
the idea of trying to maintain your health, which sounds obvious, but uh, I think a lot of people don't, and you know, trying to then bet on your bet on yourself. If you do the math, and we buy, we bought our most uh, recent through healthcare.gov when we were in Maryland. They had a Maryland state plan. But if you do the math on both, most of these plans, at least the ones that I've looked at personally, you'll see that there's usually little difference between the high deductible and the lower deductible in terms of what you're actually going to outlay over the course of a year. In my wife's case, because she has health conditions, we know that she'll easily spend through the deductible amount. But even so, it's in our case mm -hmm. worth that back because there's a chance that you won't. Now the downside being, you know, if you have the deductible only, are you actually going to get the care that you need? But we just sort of budget in advance saying she'll definitely spend it. Mm -hmm. spend a long-term health care insurance? Spend it out. This is, no, it's just regular. regular health insurance. Health. I'm throwing in, what, what do you do about the um, You know, I worry about long-term health <laughs> insurance in my uh, retirement book. And the conclusion I came to, and some people disagree with me on this, is that for most people, um, either at the low income or the very high income levels, it doesn't make any sense. There's a group of people in between who have sort of mid-range assets where it may be a good investment. As you probably know, there's, um, it, it, one, the policies, as I understand it, are, can be very complicated and there can be a lot of things that aren't covered. So you really have to be careful of what you're getting. Some people just think, well, I've got it. My problems are solved. Well, <laughs> maybe not. So um, that was the conclusion I came to, was that if you're sort of in the mid-range of assets come retirement, particularly, you may want to get long-term uh, long care insurance. My wife, of course, just hit the, I, the magic age and was able to go on uh, Medicare, so we're still celebrating over. Mm -hmm. over 62, 65, 65, 65. 65. And by the way, I, and I write too in the retirement book about things like Social Security, the best age to take it. The answer is there's no best answer, but you can do the math and probably come to a good decision on it. Yep. Yeah, please. Okay, oh, sorry. Um, my husband and I are, I've been making a 10 year plan on, our, on retirement and we need to downsize. So, what do we downsize to? Or what's economical to downsize to? Or what's. Do we do when our house is more than we need? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I'm not trying to. No, my no. books are available at your library, and, yeah, yeah. and, 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 and I write a lot about downsizing. Okay. By the way, I also write a lot for AARP. If you go to their website, aarp.org, you don't have to be a member or anything, and just Google my name, you'll find about 100 articles on there. Some of them deal with retirement, but most deal just with saving money. At, at any rate. So the, the topic is, is downsizing. Obviously, it's a big topic for a lot of people. And I, if you really crunch the numbers, you'll see that the savings could be astronomical. I mean, people think, well, I've already got the house. Maybe it's paid for. But then there's the cost to pay taxes on the house and heat the house and decorate the cost and repair the house and so on. So um, I, one of the things that, uh, that um, I wrote a lot about in that book was the idea of downsizing and specifically looking at areas where you might not have considered downsizing too when you had a family. I interviewed one family that moved when they retired. They moved sort of across town, still in close proximity to their kids and grandkids, but got a significantly less expensive house in a neighborhood that was nice, but not one that families particularly wanted um, to move to. So they, in, just as an example, they in their search said, we want to downsize, we want to save some money, we want to cash in a bear house or something less expensive, but we're setting a, I think a sort of one hour driving perimeter around where we are now. And I think that makes a lot of sense because a lot of retirees approach it of, I've got to move out of state. Um, and that can make sense, it can make sense to move out of state or out of the country, but that's sort of an insurmountable task for a lot of people, whereas if you view it as, could I save money by moving across the tracks, um, mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing millennials, in, I mean, you talk in your book about how the depression was a big impact on your grandparents, you know, it was on my parents, um, but what about millennials today? Are you seeing that they're um, embracing some of these philosophies? 
I, I don't know that I, I don't know that you could really conclude that. And, and, uh, during at the time of the Great Recession, there was a lot of there were some studies and there were uh, on, on related issues. And one of the things they found was it was definitely have an impact on millennials and and on younger people. But one of the, interesting we were talking about thrift stores before. But one of the benchmarks was that. Um, younger people started shopping at thrift stores, in some cases uh, because times were tight, but in some cases it suddenly became cool. Um, before it was not cool, my used stuff was not cool, and then it became cool. It sort of pinched us cheapskates in the, in the process. But I think that that's the kind of attitudinal shift that really um, needs, uh, needs to happen if something lasting is going to happen. Um, there was what was described as frugal fatigue during the Great Recession, where there was just so much talk about frugality that people kind of got tired of it, and now they've gone back to to their ways uh, before. But uh, I, I hope there is some lasting uh, impact, but I'm not terribly uh, terribly optimistic. I think that the best thing that can happen again is not just born out of necessity, but born out of a desire for a different lifestyle, kind of a new American dream. Um, if you will, I, I, during because I I've been writing about this stuff since before the recession, as I said, but, um, but <clears throat> during the recession there was so much information on frugality and thrift, and and I'm not saying it was bad, but I'll, it, most of it boiled down to how to save 20 percent on this pile of stuff that I've always bought, and that's not bad. I mean, use coupons, you know, it's very mechanical, it's not brain surgery, um, but. Uh, but what I hoped would come out of the recession wasn't how to save 20%, but the question of do I really need that? Do I really need all that? Is that making me any happier? There's a, I went to an Act Two class, I'm down, getting rid of your club, and this lady was 77 years old and she started this new business because she, she moved from back east. And she will go in and help seniors downsize and organize yard sales and stuff. And she'll actually even go through your stuff and tell you, hey, this is worth some money, you know, listed on Craigslist or whatever, but there, there are services out there to help you to find out what the heck we're doing, because it's all new. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing how much stuff you acquire, too. <coughs> it's it's so just, where, where does it all come from? Any other questions or comments? Well, uh, thanks so much for coming out, and I'll leave you with one last piece of cheapskate advice, which is to live every day as if it's your last, because one day, you'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming.